thank you. Um, so I want to start saying I love working in visual effects because for one reason, it allows me to be at one of the intersections of art and science. And it is at these intersections that most stories come to life. And I like to think at both, at both science and art as lenses through which we interpret reality. I see artists as visionaries that point us the way by allowing us to see things in a light we had not seen them in before. Much in the same way, scientists present us with interpretations of what we experience. Most of the times, these interpretations of the scientists are not obvious to the majority of us, and we need stories to grasp them. Uh, think of the theory of relativity. We need the story of the paradox of the twin brothers, one traveling almost at the speed of light, coming back and finding his older now brother uh, to understand it, to grasp the story. Um, we also need, for example, Dali's melting watches, which was painted to, as, a, as an explanation or as a conceptualization of Einstein's relativity theory. Um, throughout the history of art and throughout the history of science, they have gone hand in hand in order to service a story. Um, to make the example of painting, Leonardo da Vinci um, experimented at the very leading edge of art in order to paint the Last Supper. He wanted to have the control and the, to, in order to paint the amount of detail that he couldn't get with fresco. With fresco, you put the fresco up and you have to paint it before it dries. He took three years to paint the Last Supper because he wanted to have all those details, they're, 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 if, you, if you haven't read about it, there are amazing amount of details and of, uh, and of technicalities that are in the, in the Last Supper, and I recommend you read it. Um, in order to have that detail and in order to have that control over what he wanted to paint, he needed to invent a new technique. There are countless examples of that in the history of art around light. Rembrandt, one of my personal favorites, Manet, um, they studied light and they studied the way light interacts with matter and had to understand it before they could control it. There's always a dichotomy between the understanding of the phenomenon and the ability to control, to have control over the, the representation of it. And throughout, throughout history, we have searched for, for and constructed more and more sophisticated tools to produce better, more convincing representations for our stories. So, that they could reach farther. And the stories we have told have been an essential part in defining ourselves. We are the stories we tell. Our shared stories define our collective imaginary and help spread our beliefs. This is even more true with mass distribution. Movies, TV shows, web clips are undeniably some of the most suggestive and most widely reaching forms of entertainment. Just look at the box office, YouTube's download tallies. And it's important to be aware of how much these, these media influence our thinking and our discussions. Just pay attention to any of the discussions you're having today, and you will see that there is a very strong influence there. And the digital technologies are actually one of the most sophisticated tools for creating the suspension of disbelief that is at the core of those experiences. And audiences are becoming more and more discerning and much more demanding. At the beginning of filmmaking, the simple image of a train coming towards camera had audiences flee the theater. <laughs> and that, by the way, apparently is a urban myth, but it is a great story. <laughs> so, in order to service a story, we have to make images that are more credible. In a recent TED Talk, J.J. Abrams said that digital technologies are opening infinite possibilities. These endless possibilities in what we do are actually explored and realized through the work of hundreds of very, very talented artists that work passionately and relentlessly to have audiences ignore the technology and experience the magic. At Weta Digital, we have over the years created an environment where we actually model the fundamental laws and the fundamental physical rules of the things we observe. I have a few examples. If we look at how muscles 
interact with the skin in order to have skin move, the skin is actually very much influenced by the, by the muscle structure underneath and it is influenced by the relationships between the muscles. So the hard path is actually to model all of the possible interactions between the muscles and simulate them sim and understand deeply how muscles actually work rather than finding shortcuts around it. And this is actually what we do. In most of the things we do at Weta, we try to um, take examples and take, understand the phenomenon at the very deep level, at the deepest possible level, and then try to find an efficient way to bring it into the screen and control, have control over it. Because we not only want to represent, sometimes we want to extend reality a little bit. So we go through incredible amount of detail to, to actually validate our assumptions and validate the things that we do against reality. And, and this is actually what gives the, the subtlety, the subtle but important details that, that make it so that the perception that you have is such of believability. We do the same, of course, with a smile. This, that is the face of one of our leading researchers that has donated it to science, <laughs> to our science. Um, and that, that is Mark Sigar. He actually uh, studies uh, faces and the interactions. And that is, he goes through ultrasound scans of his own face in order to validate the, the assumptions that we make on how muscles move. And we do put all this detail into the models that then we um, try to push to further our understanding and then to simplify it to have control over the images we produce. We tend to do the same with hair, and in this case, I personally have donated some of my own in order to experiment. <laughs> we look at the forces that shape it um, so that we can have our character's hair mimic what hair would do in the real world and then create, have creative control over it when we need it. We look, of course, at incredible amounts of detail in, in the way skin interacts with light, because that is one of the things that us as human beings are most sensitive to. Our brain is hardwired to recognize something that is real skin, or it's a real face, or not. And of course, we do the same thing with eyes. This is, this is actually a simulation of, of, of an eye. It's a, you can tell from the rest, it's completely digital. That's Mark Seger, again, uh, testing some of our eyes technology. And we do, once again, go and uh, partner with scientific institutions in order to validate the results that we do. We try to really solve the real problems and try to get the real data from the real world in order to have the best possible starting model in order to then add that control. Then we create sophisticated tools and put them into a pipeline, uh, which is really hundreds of thousands of lines of code that pass data from one uh, piece of software to the, to the other. So it's a lot of custom written software so that the hundreds of artists that are, that are creating the final product can concentrate on the creative process and not on the technology. But what may not be immediately evident is actually that these digital technologies, the dig digital tools, are not only changing the images that we are seeing, but are also changing the process by which these images are produced. What used to be a linear model in filmmaking of pre-production, production, and post-production is actually now becoming a much more collaborative creative environment. Alex McDowell, a production designer in Hollywood, actually uh, proposed a few years ago this, he called it the mandala, as a better representation for that process. It is centered around the script and the director, but it is a collaborative process that iterates over the contributions of the various people that are involved in that process. Filmmaking is probably the most collaborative art form. And by using those same technologies to prototype the environments, the camera moves with, for example, a process called pre-visualization, more ideas can be floated, tested, and validated, eventually increasing the, the um, outcome of the creative process itself. And while that started as a technical check, will this camera fit in this room? Will this camera dolly fit in the room? Will the camera go high enough for the vision that the director wants to do? it actually ended up becoming an integral part of the creative process. I have an example from a King Kong 360 ride, which is a ride that you see if you go to Universal Studios in Los Angeles. We just completed this last year. 
if you see the bottom part is actually the low resolution, not, ver not final animation um, version that we were validating the, the design and that the director, Peter Jackson, was actually working with so that he could validate the ideas and make sure that every person on the train, since this is filmed, it, it's filmed from a single camera, but it needs to ha give the same experience to every person sitting in every car, every seat on every cart of that train, because this is a stop during the Universal Studio tours. Every person needs to have a real cinematic experience. <laughs> Those were motion caption actors, so no dinosaur was injured either. <laughs> and that creative collaboration that we were say, men mentioning before, centering around the director, helped distill that creative vision, his creative vision or her creative vision, out of those infinite possibilities. The process that James Cameron used for Avatar, for example, took this a step further and crafted an entire world that he could explore and in which he could progressively refine the movie. I have a couple of examples from that. You will have one chance, Jake. How will I know if he chooses me? He will try to kill you. Outstanding. And that was what was filmed on set? You will have one chance, Jake. How will I know if he chooses me? He will try to kill you. Outstanding. That is what he saw on the camera as he was exploring the set, the chance, virtual Jake. stage. How will I know if he chooses me? He will try to kill you. And these are progressive iterations of the animation. You will have one chance, Jake. How will I know if he chooses me? He will try to kill you. Outstanding. You will have one chance, Jake. How will I know if he chooses me? He will try to kill you. Outstanding. And then the final version. You will have one chance, Jake. How will I know if he chooses me? He will try to kill you. Outstanding. Thank you. And while these technologies are at the leading edge of technology today, it is absolutely imaginable that the next generation of filmmakers, Generation Y, I guess, uh, who are now growing up immersed in these environments since they're very, very young, will help us push the boundaries of storytelling even further. There is a theme on your badge, on the shoulders of giants. In this room, in this audience, I believe we are all giants. We're all science, scientists and artists in our own way. We try to push the boundaries. We have the responsibility, I believe, to build the ladders that get to our shoulders and to keep getting to the shoulders ahead of us. Those ladders are the stories that we tell and they are worth sharing. Thank you very much. Oh.